Hello, and welcome to another episode of Tech. Today, we are going to be talking about the evolution of tech journalism and, in general, the impact of technology on news and reporting. Technology has had, obviously, a, a profound effect on different industries, including uh, journalism and news. And it has changed over the years, both how we report stories, uh, how we gather information, and how we consume news. What I think is interesting is that in that process of reporting faster, but also differently, right? Multimedia plays a much bigger role today than it did, you know, even five years ago. And by doing that, expanding the audience that a lot of um, programs and news organizations are able to reach, we had an impact on other uh, industries and other ways of reporting news. One of the biggest one is obviously social media and the fact that the same technologies that uh, today reporters are leveraging to report in a different way is also available to consumers who become uh, in a way, media experts in their mind, right? And share um, a lot of uh, uh, information and in, in news, especially at a local level. In turn, this has put more accountability and pressure on news organization to report differently um, with a higher degree of standard. And we are right at the beginning of a new era with AI and generative AI in particular. And I think that the moment for disrupting news is here, but also the moment of really looking at ethics and how we're going to leverage this new um, technology and, and empowering not just news reporters, but in general um, consumers and, and people in the uh, news industry to be more aware of what is real and what isn't, what is accurate and what isn't. And I could not have a better guest today uh, to talk about all of this. Uh, Sasha Twining is a well-respected and experienced British national and international TV and radio presenter. Uh, she has been uh, a host on different uh, programs across TV uh, channels in, in the UK. Um, and in addition to that, she's someone who shares um, my pain and excitement of being a Mobile World Congress every year. Uh, she is in huge demand across Europe to debate and, uh, and participate in conferences across different industry and very well versed in the tech space. Um, her dedication actually to tech has gone as far as planting an NFC chip uh, in under her skin and then produce a program for BBC talking about her experience. So please help me welcome Sasha to today's tech. Oh, Carol, it's fantastic to see you. Look, thank you so much for inviting me because this is a fascinating area. And uh, yeah, as you say in your introduction, one that we, we need to tackle and we need to talk about. But yeah, it's good to be here. Lots of thank you. Thank you for your thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you're super busy. You've been traveling all over the place uh, over the past month. So I really appreciate the time. And I want to start with a question that maybe has an answer that is so obvious, but I think there's more to it than the, what I think you might be able to say. And is if you think about technology and how technology has impacted news and, and generally journalism and your career, what do you think the most impactful device or service has been? What, since I started? Goodness me. Um, well, I started a very long time ago because I, I was working already in the media when I was doing um, the equivalent of high school. So I started really, really young. Um, and when I left school, I, I decided not to go on to university, but I actually stayed in the media. So I, I've, I've been doing it for a long time. And when I first started, if you wanted to talk to somebody, if you wanted to go and interview someone, I think what, what you really had to think about was how you were going to get to them. So that was quite likely either getting out on foot, getting a bus, getting in the car, um, taking with you a, a tape recorder that was 
possibly about so big, literally, and it weighed. Well, it weighed more than I lift in the gym now, and literally one. <laughs> Was, and it, it was quite literally um, two reels that, of tape that would sort of run over a recording head. And when you you would record and when you got back to the office, you would have your razor blade and sticky tape. And you would quite literally cut into your tape with your headphones on. You'd listen to it and you'd, you'd learn with, with, um, and you'd put it back together with your sticky tape. Of course, the difference is now I think you don't have to be there and I think that is that's the crucial difference um we don't have to be places now I think it's important to say that that's not to say that we shouldn't be places because I totally agree yeah that that is that that that's different and I'm sure we'll come on to that but the difference is if I want to interview someone all I really need is for them to have a smartphone and connectivity and that's the difference. And, you know, something like this, this this has changed the world. And it's, it's changed my industry as it has changed so many industries. But it's opened up the doors, as I'm sure we'll talk about, for anyone to broadcast. But it's opened up the doors for somebody like me to talk to someone who is anywhere in the world. And, and that is the biggest difference. And I think we, we really saw the impact that that sort of technology has made during the pandemic absolutely yeah when we couldn't travel when we couldn't get to places but it became even more imperative to get people's voices heard and their stories told so we had that really difficult juxtaposition of not being able to get out not being able to be face to face with people but actually having to use the technology which thank goodness now we you know we can use like that so yeah I think I think that is you know it's it's an obvious one um and it probably is going to be the same for many interest industries as well but it's the smartphone yeah I I tend to agree with you just because the smartphone then created other possibilities right from an application perspective technology perspective that runs on it um you know what we're doing today wouldn't have been possible uh, without some of the uh, kind of development that we saw during the pandemic. You know, you're in London, I'm in Atlanta, and here we are having a conversation. Yeah. And absolutely. and I think your point about the voices is, in, you know, is critical because um, it, it has opened up the opportunity for people that could not be reached or could not be in a position to necessarily travel to a studio or something else to have that voice. Absolutely. And I, I think if I may, an, an example that I will never forget from the pandemic was uh, from when I was working on the BBC World Service. And at that stage, we were desperately trying to tell stories from around the world um, to try and make sense of what was happening. I mean, it's, it's easy now to look back in hindsight and sort of see how things panned out. But if you take yourself back to those early weeks if you imagine doing a global news program we were trying really hard to get the different voices and the different stories and the different timelines yes. for different countries all that were the were going through different things at different times and that was so important for our international audience to hear that but i think one of the things that will really stick with me is um actually a piece of work that my colleague ed did and Ed, fantastic journalist, and he really, really wanted to tell the stories of people who were uh, li living in communities that you wouldn't normally hear from, sort of unstructured um, communities within Kenya and, pla and places like that. And he he w reached out to a charity and they were able to put him in touch with an amazing woman called Josephine. Um, who was was living in an area, uh, living in in a very unstructured community with her three children, and Josephine had a smartphone, and she didn't have connectivity, but the woman who lived next door did. And first of all, Ed was able to do an interview with her, and then Josephine decided that that wasn't enough she wanted to record her own diary. So she would record voice notes on her smartphone. And then when the woman next door turned on the power, 
and turned on the connectivity. She would send these messages to my colleague, Ed, who was working from home with his family in London. And so it could be, you know, I think it was the middle middle of the night and he would just get a ping on his smartphone and there would be a voice note recorded by Josephine, who was going through the most horrendous times with, within her area and, uh, and, and, and trying to survive. And that was so really important. And we turned that into um, a diary sequence to actually hear the real voices and the real story. Now, that couldn't have happened without the smartphone. Right because we would have needed someone to have been there to have interviewed her. But the fact that she was in control of her own narrative, she was able to decide when she wanted to talk, what she wanted to talk about. And of course it was incredibly personal. And her voice. Yeah. Yeah, And it was her voice. Um, But because of the pandemic, we had to find other ways to ensure these stories got on air and therefore you would become very creative and so, you know, her story was told possibly in a way that we may not have done without yep. the pandemic. Um, and that's so amazing, right? That you you think out the box and because of a situation you're in, you have to think differently. And, and hopefully some of these changes will remain. I actually still remember during, um, it was just before the pandemic, one of my latest, uh, the, the last flights I ever took being in San Jose airport and talking to you. <laughs> about a Huawei story when everything was happening in in uh, in the UK because of regulation and doing um and doing a, an interview with you as I was trying to get a kid next to me to stop screaming oh, well, I mean, that, that was the thing I mean we will all look back on these stories but you know the the other thing was I was I was actually sitting in this room where I'm sitting talking to you now and we brought you know, the BBC brought my studio here. Right. So, I mean, but it was literally just a microphone and a tiny, tiny little box, no bigger than like one of the extra large matchbox type yep. sites. And, you know, I plugged that into my broadband, no other kit. Um, I have nice. my laptop and that's that's how we did it. And so for, you know, a period when I was, there was a, a program we were presenting called, I was presenting called Business Matters. And that came from this room during the pandemic and you know never in your wildest dreams do you ever think that these things would happen or that they would be possible yeah yeah and and as a guest as well I've had that many times where before the pandemic it was like well if you can't make it to the studio we are not gonna be able to have you as a guest and now it's like it doesn't matter especially when people see the setup with the lights and the camera and everything else is like I might as well be here because it's like a studio but um let's talk about I I mentioned this at the beginning the relationship between the fact that you know the smartphone is such a pervasive device uh, and has empowered normal consumers to tell stories, right? Uh, linked to, you know, something that might happen in their city or whatever it is, you know, and we've seen a lot of that, both live footage and then people that actually go on air and tell their stories, have their podcast. And the impact that that is having on the traditional media, because there is a balance, right? You, as a traditional media, obviously, first of all, you're scrutinized, right? You, you have regulations that you have to oblige to. Um, you also have a responsibility of being accurate and, and doing your due diligence. But at the same time, you're under pressure from a time perspective, right? You want to be the one breaking the news or, or having a bit of an angle. So how do you balance that, Sasha? Well, so it's, uh, I, I'm, there's only one answer. It has to be right. Uh, yes, of course, everyone wants to be first, but it has to be right and it has to be yeah. accurate. And, you know, there's um, there's a whole book of law, which, you know, to, to do what I do, you have to have digested and, and, and know every single facet of. So, yes, everyone wants to be first. And of course, there's competition between, you know, different journalists and different news organizations. But it has to be right. I, I, you know, people who are not trained in this area or people who find themselves in a situation where they are in the middle of a new story unfolding. And because of smartphones, anyone can be a broadcaster. Yep. Now, that's brilliant 
but it comes, as you say, with responsibilities. And I think the question is where we put those responsibilities. Do we enforce those that broadcast to take on those responsibilities? Or do we look to the platforms that are enabling them to broadcast in, the, in, in that way? Where is that responsibility? Because we're living in a world increasingly of, of disinformation, of you know misinformation, of all sorts of different stories that people will either believe or not believe, but will make a judgment without a full context. Yeah. And, uh, you know, all of us are, are very, very painfully aware of that. And I, I tell you what's quite interesting is that as a little aside from this, I remember being a presenter on Sky a few years ago, many years ago, and we have something called VGC or UGC, user-generated content or viewer-generated content. And I remember when we first started to have emails come in from viewers saying, well, I mean, the example I remember is there'd been a plane crash and I was on air and we were breaking news and we were rolling with this story and people who were close were, were sending bits of footage mm -hmm. now I remember thinking this quality is nowhere near as good enough to go on air it's awful the camera is shaking the phone is shaking we can't use this but very quickly viewers became used to um, accepting a lower standard of quality if it was sent from a fellow viewer and it was you know the very yes yeah. yeah exactly uh, and then people learned really quickly that if they were filming stuff, they they had those numbers saved in their phone to uh, And that has now morphed into people, as you say, putting themselves in the story and being broadcasters themselves. Uh, and that is, that's, I think, where we have to work out where the responsibility lies and how to give the full context. Um, and if you watch the big mainstream medias or you look at their websites online, you will notice now that they are beginning to um, explain how they news gather, explain the processes behind to try and, and show how credible they are and what journalistic standards they adhere to. Because I think the onus is also on mainstream media to prove that they are who they say they are and why people can trust them. I, I agree. And I think that there's more, there's more than just the news itself, right? There are ethical decisions that you're making. I always remember, um, you know, when something happens and I don't know why I'm thinking about Kobe Bryant um, helicopter crash yeah. in particular, where, you know, the news kind of gets ahead of itself and, and the family doesn't even know yet, right? The, there, there's that balance of there's a human impact of news um, and, you know, and ethics that link to it that I think as a, maybe as a, as a consumer, you don't necessarily think about um, that as a news corporation, you, you absolutely must. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, you know, if this is scary, we are going to get to a whole different level of scary and exciting if you're thinking about generative AI and how, you know, AI up until now is being used by media to help support reporters in their work, right? There's, there's analytics that can be run to give you the information that you, you can use. And we've had instances in the printed media of uh, now articles being generated by AI maybe not always getting it right you know so the the in my view generative ai is a tool the reporter or the analyst in my case is still the one responsible for the content that ultimately goes out right but when you think about generative ai what scares you and what excites you uh, about the use within you know any aspect of of news and and media yeah, I think a lot scares me and a lot excites me as well. But just to the point that you made about articles being written with, you know, with with AI or chat GPT or something, you know, I have to say, I cannot think of anybody I have ever worked with either using that as a technique or any editor I've ever worked with giving even a second's thought to that being okay. Um, but, it, you know, if it's possible, it's possible. 
if something is possible doesn't mean to say it should be possible sure. but yeah um what well, you know what what excites mm. me um well look tech excites me so the possibilities of what we could do will always excite me but you know the i don't i don't want to sound as if um we should all be overly scared of these things because i am hoping that regulations will catch up and I am hoping that we will start to get uh, a little more responsibility with how the technology is being developed because nobody wants to be in a world where there's a possibility that we have an AI generated newsreader that we don't realize is an AI generated newsreader and again I think it's the transparency from uh, media organizations but actually you know, it goes back to my other point as well. It's where that responsibility lies. So, you know, what are people using? How are they doing this? But to a certain extent, you know, manipulation within what we see or or hear, um, and I'm not talking about news here or anyone that I've worked yeah. with, but manipulation will always be there because it is the way things are edited. And that's not always a bad thing either this is you know could be giving extra context or whatever i think we're right now seeing a really interesting time who work as voiceovers and they're finding or some of them have found that they've given permission for their voice to be used for an advert and that voice is now because of various technology being used yes Again and again and revoicing other things. And of course, the bottom line is they're not being paid. Paid what is their asset. Now, you know, you could sort of, you know, shrug that off and go, well, you know, well, you know, they'll have to find another way to, to make their living. Y yes, but, you know, thin end of the wedge. Where where do we start to look at what what we want AI to do? But this is not just media that's having to have this conversation. Um, I was on stage with the CEO of Lockheed Martin at mm -hmm. WC this year. Um, you know, one of the conversations was AI within the defense industry. Um, and that's a huge area. And he was saying, you know, it, it this needs to be tackled now. We need to work out what we want. Um as a human race, really. And I would yeah. say the same for viewers as well. We have to work out what we want. I, I totally agree. I, I think we cannot, absolutely, we cannot afford to have like a social media moment like we have had over the past few years where, you know, when social media started, nobody thought about the ramification, the negative ramification of social media, right? And here we're in, in a even more, potentially dangerous moment where we need to think about what is ethical and what isn't. We need to put the guardrails. I don't know if I'm as optimistic as you are on regulations, maybe because of uh, where I live versus where you live. I know. And, and I, I, you know, I, I don't have the answer on this one. And I hate to say it, but I don't think anyone does at the moment. Yeah. And, and that's what it I is, right? How optimistic I am. I think I'm just hopeful. <laughs> Should yeah. we just say hopeful rather than optimistic? And and we have to be, right? I, I think to your point about the, the opportunity that this technology opens up to do things differently and better. And I talk about this often when I talk about education in particular, you know, let's not have the kids say, no, you cannot use it, but actually teach them how to use it responsibly, right? Yeah. And ethically yeah. and yeah. versus saying, no, you cannot use it. Cause it's the same, you know, it's the PC, it's the calculator, it's whatever other tool that we've had in the past. And I think that's where, you know, education is important and, uh, responsibility and you know really from a from a technology provider perspective accountability for what is that is happening yeah and you know can I just also throw into yeah. that our educators as well because I think within schools we need to be teaching our children and our young people to look for the source of information. Absolutely. And, you know, it's I, I have a young child and, you know, I will say to him or to his friends, oh, where did you hear that? And I'll hear, oh, no, no, I read it on Facebook or, or I, I saw it on YouTube. <laughs> That's the platform, okay? You know, that's just the means to you seeing this. Yes. What's the source? 
Can you trust that source? Why can you trust that source? Um, you know, it, great stuff out there and there's stuff that's misleading as well. So look at that source. And I, I do think education has a huge role to play in that. And I know schools in the UK are definitely pushing that. Uh, I, I don't have experience in schools in, in, in other countries, but it is, it's just vital. Yeah, I um, I wish I could say the same. You know, my country right now has the opposite problem. We're actually taking um, history away from education and, you know, giving a view that is a bit different from what actually um, is the, the full history and the full data set that you should have to form your opinion and, and your um, kind of knowledge uh, perspective. But here we are. Um, I get off a depressing topic to move to another <laughs> depressing topic which oh, is no, women. <laughs> <laughs> women and it's 2023 you yeah. are a well sought after you know panel moderator uh and host for all sorts of industry when i look at tech i'm still looking at counting the women that are on stage um and you know when i get the invite thinking okay i can see there's five men on the panel they want the woman just to balance it off a little bit where are we where do you think we made progress and where there's still a lot of work that needs to be done that's such such a good point i wish i had the answer to this one so first off it's not just tech. So I work, um, you know, across the world, as you say, many industries um, hosting debate panels and, and, and debates and facilitating conferences. And it's sustainable energy, it's agriculture, it's all of these different areas that you have this challenge as well. And it's, yeah, Count, count the women. I mean, you ask what the difference is. The difference is people are now counting. Yeah, People are now aware of it with that and, and don't accept it as being right. But now the next step is properly doing something about it. Because, you know, it's the old adage, if you, if you can't be it, if you can't see it. And, you know, that that's the problem that we have to overcome. And I have done a lot of thinking about this. And um, I wrote a, a short LinkedIn article about this for International Women's Day. And it's like, why, why don't I see enough women on panels? Because they, you know, they, they are there, but why oh, aren't they being represented? Yeah. So, you know, without wishing to blame anyone, because this isn't, you know, no one's doing this deliberately. I think there's a certain, um, I really don't want to use the word laziness. Oh, no, let's go ahead and say it because that's what it is. <laughs> the thing is, if you're a conference organizer and you're putting together a panel, it is easier to go to the tried and tested guests. Totally. Totally, totally easier. And it's not just easier, but you know immediately the audience will know who they are uh, because they've been around for a while. And therefore, they are more likely to be men. So that's one challenge. It is really hard to find new panelists. It always is because people just assume that, oh, such and such will do it. The next stage of this, I think I'm going to point to the men on this one because male panelists, I'm pretty sure, wouldn't even think twice about accepting an invitation without thinking, actually, do I have a female colleague that... I really should put forward instead. And I can absolutely guarantee that if you put those men on a panel and you asked them if we needed more women in their particular industry, they would say yes. And they would absolutely be pushing for more women within the industry and doing all of that. But I hate to say it's probably not occurred to them that the next invitation they get for a panel, just take a beat and think if there's actually somebody else. And if they really want to be on that panel, think if there's someone else as well and then offer you and a female colleague to the organisers as both of you to come and give different perspectives. Um, and then there's, there's the real issue about panels, about it takes time out of your day. And do you know what, Caro? You know what that comes back down to? That comes down to, I hate to use the childcare reason. No, it, it, it is. It's that. And if we still have a society where 
we do have more women taking on the bulk of China. Yep. They are going to have more of a of a challenge to travel to events. Absolutely. You know? And you know that is you know we can try and put blame on any of those three points that I've I've made there. But that you know is a whole societal thing for actually I think all of that. Right. Um, it's getting better but it's getting better because we're trying to make it better. I think we need to try harder in lots of different areas, but one of them is a really tricky nut to crack. I I totally agree with you. And actually I was recently talking to uh, an event organizer who said, well, you know, I always, I'm hesitant to ask women to participate because they let me down because of the last minute there's, they can't, they can't do it anymore. They're, and I was like, okay, well, did you look into why that is the case? And childcare is one, but the other one, you more often than not, is the fact that we do tend to say yes to more things that we can do because that's what we do, right? Yeah. And yeah. then we balance. Linked to that, there's also the seniority that a lot of the times you have on you know the invite women tend to be at a lower level of seniority which means that they have less flexibility on their own time to decide no actually i'm going to say no to this so that i can do the panel over here men don't necessarily have that and and obviously i'm sure that we'll have a ton of comments saying that oh i'm generalizing but yeah I'm not- you know you have to with something like this because you, you know, we could look at every single individual case and we'd have a different answer and a different reason for, for all of them. But you're absolutely right. And then if you also think, you know, not all speakers get paid. Correct. To, to speak. So you're asking uh, a woman to possibly lose a day's pay to speak at a conference if she is maybe freelance or she is um well you know any any other sort of work situation and that happens more often with women uh, which because the pay gap is what it is and you know the woman will get pitched the oh it's going to be good for your brand it's going to be good for your visibility versus the guy who is going to get you're going to be paid you know three thousand pounds or whatever yeah and it's really frustrating because i don't know the easy answer there's, well, there is, there is, there's no easy answer that will sort all of that out. You know, to, to kind of circling all back to where we started and technology and social media, I think one way has been that now, especially women, are way more vocal about this and open and call organizers out and yes. say, no, I'm not going to go and come to your conference and pay for my own travel and not get paid for, you know, the, the networking opportunity that you're offering me or Absolutely. comparing pay as well. You know, why is a, a woman participant getting paid less than a, a man if there's no difference in status and, you know, and brand and all Absolutely. of that? I would suggest if, if, you know, a man and a woman are both invited to appear on the panel, I always say all panelists are equal. Once you're sitting on that stage, the four or five of you're you... You're there for a reason, right? You're there for a reason. And actually, I don't really care if if one's a professor, one's a doctor, one's this, one's that. As a moderator, actually, I don't care because all panellists are equal and they That's are there a very good for point. a reason. And therefore, they should all be paid the same. And if you're having to pay one more than the other, I think you should be wondering why they're not the keynote speaker. Uh, you know, it's, you know, you're not doing it, but you know, there are, there are, there are little tricks to try and make things better. But, you know, I really feel for conference organizers because I know how difficult it is. And I know how committed all the clients I I work with are to try and get, um, more diversity, more balance in, you know, in every single way as well. It's, it is, it is the frustration of, exactly what we've just been and and what we're doing now also has impacted that world right the fact that you see more and more hybrid conferences staying on after covid and allowing for that to have different voices yeah do you know what though i mean i i'm undecided on this one if i have a panel with three people on stage and one is virtual it's hard it's hard but it also i think for the audience's point of view that panelist has almost got to be 
you know, even more important if they're virtual. If they're not there, they have to work even harder. Harder. That's true. You lose that wonderful body language and the presence on stage. Yes. You're virtual. And therefore, you always feel a little bit not quite there, part of it. And, you know, if you have an issue with women not feeling part of it, actually, the last <laughs> thing you want to do is have the woman on the virtual. On the, yep. 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 <laughs> So I don't know. It's a work in progress, but at least we're starting to work on it. Well, I, I think you gave some really gay, great pointers for people to follow up on. And, you know, I wish that I could talk to you for another half an hour at least, but we are at time. Uh, what I always say is that our conversation doesn't have to end here. So I would love for you to share where can people find you to get to know you more and continue to engage in conversations. Ab ab absolutely. Um, you, you know, find me on LinkedIn, connect there, please do. Find me on Twitter, um, find me on my website, sashatwining.com. And professionally, I am the corporate facilitator, uh, traveling all across the world, doing lots of different uh, events and trying to, you know, actually get more female representation in industries that sometimes I am the only woman on stage, but I guess at least there's me, but let's hope maybe this time next year, it isn't always just me. I and <laughs> clapping and everything that comes with it. Let's hope that's the case. I'm looking forward to seeing you live soon somewhere and not having to wait till February in, for Mobile World Congress. It's been an absolute delight to have you on. Really, really appreciate the time. I've loved it. It's it's great. It's really great to talk about these things. I'm glad we are. And it's been really enjoyable. Thank you for asking me. Thank you so much, Sasha. See you soon. Take care.